Thanks for inviting me to speak. I've long been convinced that Australia needs to do a better job in vocational education, and I've watched with dismay the disastrous policy mistakes of the past decade. Among the many failures in the education reform movement, so-called, the attempt to promote for-profit education has been the most complete. For-profit education has failed at every level. For-profit school operators like Edison in the United States, launched with high expectations, have failed miserably. The Swedish experiment, for quite a few years seen as the exemplar of success, has turned out very badly. For-profit universities have been similarly disastrous, most notably in the United States. Australia has its own share of disasters. The biggest has been U21 Global, which was touted as a global online university, but came to nothing. There have been many others. But in terms of scale, relative to a national system, the disaster of fee help and TAFE privatisation outweighs them all. Edison Schools was founded in 1992 and was widely viewed as representing the future of school education. Its plans were drawn up by a committee headed by John Chubb, the co-author of the most influential single critique of public sector education in the United States. Uh, this is Chubb and Moe's book in 1990. After a highly successful share market launch, Edison's decline was remorseless. It gradually lost its contracts to run schools, along with its stock market listing, and eventually rebranded itself as a provider of educational services, such as testing and the provision of course materials. Even operating in a highly favourable political and financial climate, Edison was unable to deliver on its promise of transforming the school sector, and has now ceased to operate schools. However, Edison and similar organisations have re-emerged in zombie form as providers of management services to so-called charter schools, many of which are effectively non-profit fronts for for-profit corporations. Despite repeated failures, charter schools remain the great hope of US educational reformers. Yet the results have been consistently disappointing. The majority of charter schools have done no better than public schools, despite the fact that they have much more capacity to select their students. Sweden, until recently the poster child for the for-profit sector, is now in a state of crisis with declining performance and growing inequality. Sweden introduced voucher-style reforms in 1992 and opened the market to for-profit schools. Initially favourable assessments were replaced by disillusionment as the performance of the school system as a whole deteriorated. Scores on the international PISA test plummeted. By 2015, the majority of the public favoured banning for-profit schools. The Minister for Education described the system as a political failure. Other critics described its failure in even harsher terms. Although a full analysis has not yet been undertaken, it seems likely that the for-profit schools engaged in cream skimming, that is, admitting able and well-behaved students while pushing more problematic students back into the public system. The rules under which the reform was introduced included so-called safeguards to prevent cream skimming. But such safeguards have historically proved ineffectual in the face of the profits to be made by evading them, as Australian experience has shown. Similar processes took place in Chile, which banned for-profit education in 2015. Far worse than this are for-profit universities like the University of Phoenix in the United States, which have prospered by recruiting poor students who are eligible for federal Pell Grants and enrolling them in degree programs they never finish. Phoenix collects the US government cash while the students are lumbered with debts they can never repay and can't even discharge in bankruptcy. Australian education reformers, such as Alan Gilbert, then Vice-Chancellor at the University of Melbourne, presented the University of Phoenix as the future of education and its critics as Luddite equivalents of the 19th century handloom weavers. The exposure of this group of universities as scams, based on extracting US government grants for students who will never graduate, had little impact on ideologues. As recently as 2014, the executive director of the Group of Eight Universities claimed, in relation to the exposure of the University of Phoenix, that learning from failure is a step to success. Well, if you buy that, we're certainly doing plenty of learning. Under the Obama administration, many of these fraudulent operations were shut down. However, it seems likely that the Trump administration and its education secretary, Betsy DeVos, who's heavily into for-profit schooling, will be much more favourable. The most prominent Australian venture into for-profit higher education was U21 Global, 
a joint venture of the university has 21 alliance of universities, of which the most prominent driver has been the University of Melbourne. Launched in 2001, it projects enrolments of 60,000 students and annual revenue of $500 million to be achieved by 2010. None of these targets were achieved, and the whole venture was eventually sold in 2013 to a Mauritius-based company now operating in Malaysia under the name Global Next. Melbourne University Private was a spin-off of the University of Melbourne, uh, which operated between 1998 and 2005. It was designed as a profit-making venture which would enable Melbourne University to get around the controls associated with public funding. Like U21 Global, uh, it was the product of Alan Gilbert, then Vice-Chancellor, like U21 Global, modelled on the University of Phoenix. Over eight years, MUP lost $20 million. This is in fact believed to be a conservative estimate given that there were large startup costs which weren't included. John Kane, the former Premier of Victoria, estimated the total cost at $150 million. These are among the most spectacular failures, but there have been many others, notably including the UNSW Singapore campus, which closed in 2007. And the failure goes both ways. UK and US universities have set up subsidiaries in Australia which have mostly failed. Given all these failures, why do so many advocates of economic reform still believe that for-profit education is desirable? The core assumption is that education is a marketable commodity and that markets function best under conditions of competition among suppliers and free choice for consumers. Given these assumptions, the best outcomes will generally arise when services are provided on a for-profit basis. In his influential book, Reclaiming Education, James Toyle lists seven virtues of the profit motive. They include brand names, teacher incentives, rational investment decisions, and cost effectiveness. And these are goals sought by education reformers in Australia. Crucially, for-profit education can only be understood in the context of public funding. The idea that publicly funded services should be supplied by for-profit firms is a cornerstone of new public sector management, sometimes described in more grandiose terms as the reinvention of government. The relevant three-word slogan here is steering, not rowing. That is, the role of government should be to ensure that education is available rather than to provide education. The crucial vehicle for replacing public with private provision is called contestability. The term contestability is drawn from microeconomic theory. The idea is that in an initially monopolistic market, the entry of competitors or even the possibility of their entry will eliminate monopoly profit. The other magic word is choice. The model is one in which consumers with well-defined preferences are assumed to face known prices. The relevant case here is that of markets for differentiated products. Choice ensures that the products supplied are those actually wanted by consumers rather than those producers, in this case schools, universities and TAFEs, might prefer to supply. Why does the for-profit model fail? First, the idea that competition will enhance diversity and choice is wrong. Economic analysis shows that in markets of this kind, for-profit providers will converge on a single model. We've seen examples of this in the university sector, where, given freedom to compete on price, all universities choose the maximum price. Similarly, given the opportunity to pick a unique flagship product, virtually all choose an MBA. The second problem arises from the availability of public subsidies. It's much easier to find innovative ways to game a poorly monitored system than to improve on educational systems that have developed over centuries. Finally, a crucial feature of the for-profit model is that it rejects professionalism and an education ethos. These are seen as self-serving claims by educators seeking to avoid competition and contestability. The disaster in vocational education and training encompassed all the worst features of for-profit education. This disaster was both predictable and predicted given the exposure of massive rorts in Victoria, where the model originated. The problems were exacerbated by fee help, which took as its model the successful use of income contingent loans in the HEC scheme, but made crucial changes. First, fees were uncapped. This has also been done for full fee courses in the university sector, with dubious results. Second, and critically, the target market consisted largely of financially unsophisticated people with limited earnings prospects. For this group, incurring a large debt that might never be called in 
in return for a small initial benefit, such as a free laptop, could be made to sound appealing. The outcome has been a disastrous rundown in vocational education at a time of increasing need. Vast amounts of public money have been spent on worthless for-profit courses, while the TAFE sector has suffered drastic cutbacks. What's the alternative? It's clear that the tweaks that have been made to the system so far haven't been adequate. Even after the reforms, new scandals have emerged on a daily or weekly basis. So, what would be required for a fundamental reform? How can we get there from here? Three steps would help. First, we should cap and progressively reduce the share of funding going to private institutions, and particularly for-profits. Second, we should severely restrict marketing expenditure for both private and public institutions to, say, 1% of total revenue. The worst offenders here have been the for-profits, but the problem is not confined to the for-profit sector. There is no benefit in having TAFEs and universities mounting slick, content-free marketing campaigns aimed at domestic students. Finally, regulation based on formal compliance should be replaced by externally assessed measures of successful completion. Institutions giving substandard qualifications or with the low completion rates typical of for-profits should be shut down. Changing policy on an issue like this is like turning a super tanker. Support for microeconomic reform and neoliberalism remains strong in elite circles long after the general public has soured on the idea. Faced with demonstrated failure, the response has been to seek minor adjustments rather than fundamental reassessments. But public hostility is increasing and is reflected in the general collapse of faith in the political system. People rightly expect that viable and affordable pathways to workplace success will be available for their children upon graduation from high school. The challenge is to be ready with a realistic education policy which meets this expectation. Thank you for your attention.